Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 24 of Verdicts of the Ancient Kings. Um, episode titles titled No Problema, as we go over Scars of War, talk about the latest puzzle, do a lot of limited analysis, and then talk about the upcoming Cosmic Crown showdown and what we may see from the constructed, um, well, what we may see in the constructed format there. Alongside me, I do have Nico. Nico, how are you doing? Good, good. I'm very burnt out on farming like a madman. I, I have lots of llama herded them together. A lot, a lot of llama herding going on this weekend. Yeah, I heard. Um, do you have any issues viewing the stream? I'm, I'm not actually seeing it on my side. I don't see it yet either, but it says offline. One second, let me refresh. Yeah, I'm. We're just trying to make sure everything is good. For some reason, it's like I see it streaming, but it does. It says it's offline. Yep, it's offline. Working. One Great. second, let me refresh. Yeah. All right, there you go. And now I need to mute it. All of a sudden, it says I'm offline, and then all of a sudden, it says, "Hey, look, you're gonna hear yourself." All right. So everything is um, everything is all set up and looking good to go. Sorry for technical difficulties. Um, as we well, let's just jump straight into last week's puzzle since and people want to know who the winners are. Um, here is last week's puzzle. Um, why don't you go ahead and explain it one more time before we get straight into the results? Sure. So the the puzzle two weeks ago was set up for um, it's kind of a PVE legal puzzle because one of the cards that makes it easy to solve is PVE related. Um, that puzzle is, oh, I see this is the old part without the solution. So if you're, it's your opponent's turn, he has a big deck, so basically we don't want you to do mill. There's zero cards in play, zero cards in the crypt, zero cards in hand, and they have 15 health. You only have three out of three resources you have one card in hand, one card in your deck, one wild threshold, two sapphire thresholds, no cards in crypt, no cards in play, no charges. Champion and charge powers do not apply. You can use RNG for the puzzle, but no deck recursion. And the challenge is win on your turn, what card in hand, and what card in deck in the sequencing. If you do use RNG as part of the challenge, what is a percentage chance the entire sequence would resolve in the same way? So... The solution for this basically was on your opponent's turn, before the end of their turn, you cast a Shroom Party. And Shroom Party is a PvP or PvE card that says um, create one through five Shroomkin at random, which are just one one Shroomkins uh, or Shroom Pins, and um, put them into play under your control. There is also equipment for it, but the equipment doesn't really matter in this case. It's just really the card. That particular card for three resources is the best quick action creation card that I can think of in the game that actually gives you permanent troops. Mm -hmm. So then on your turn, the, the card you want to draw in, in your deck is a polymorphic army. So you draw that and then cast it, and then you'd want to hit five... Um, all five of your troops transforming into three attack or more troops. So in PvE, I looked at the card pool. I think there are like over about 200 potential solutions for two drops because Polymorphic Army has a, a 1x plus, uh, or it's just x plus 1. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to pay 2 plus 1. So the, the Shroomkins would, or Shroompins would all turn into two cost troops so you would have to hit a troop that will deal at least three attack damage so the best way to do that in this case is to do it before you declare attack because mm -hmm. there's a few two cost troops you can hit that have rage or some other trigger when they attack mm -hmm. um so i think i figured out that it would be a 20 percent chance to get five shroom pin and then a 20 percent chance for each shroom pin to turn into a troop that could actually deal enough damage to kill your opponent. So you would have to use RNG, and it's like 20 to the 6th power, basically, or point, point 0.2 to the 6th power. So um, it's not going to happen very often, but it is a potential way to solve this problem. I, I didn't get a lot of solutions to this, so I don't think a lot of people really came up with it as a solution. So um, if our puzzles are too hard, let me know. We'll try to tone them down a bit. Um, I do like to try to keep them 
at a fairly high level because we are giving away prizes and I, I want to make it challenging mm-hmm. and also teach people about different cards in the game. So uh, do let us know, though, um, if they're a little too hard for you. Yeah, it, it, this one seemed a little bit fringe between the Polymorphic Army and the Shroom Party rolling dice essentially like six times in order to get your 15 damage. Yeah, I wanted to make one that was super RNG heavy. I don't think there is another solution, um, even you know, with random cards in your deck. But um, yeah, it's it's super RNG. All right. So um, for all of you guys out there, and Avius is the winner. Um, Runner ups are Contrary and Siru. And I need to figure out what I'm going to be giving away. Uh, I, I think once a month I'll do Convocation 2015 um, as as a complete set prize, and um, I think I might give away th- the three mercenaries and maybe a storm code if I can find one. So um, as as the grand prize, and then a couple of con or I'll, I'll figure out something. It will be good for everyone. Um, thanks to everyone who participated, and it really is worth your time to try and come up with these solutions. Um, we do try to put. A large amount of prize support out there. I can ninja myself into the Hex headquarters, as some of you guys may have saw, seen from the Scars of War release event, which um, a three-hour stream turned into a ten-hour event, and I was exhausted by the end of that. So, yeah, that that's for another time, a, diff- a different talk. But let's go ahead and go straight into well, um, after our first full weekend of Scars of War, there's actually a lot of different types of decks that we saw in Limited. And I I just wanted to talk about all of the different types of decks, what we saw played, how useful they were, and what what we could really see here. So um, I'm just going to go over a couple couple of them. Nico, feel free to chime in as I talk about these. But um, one of the deck types that I saw used specifically the ardent and the underworld champions that do not have threshold but let you gain a charge every time you play an ardent or underworld troop now rift spasm outside of those champions i i would say they're like maybe a a one or a two out of ten what do you think nico um yeah outside of those champions i wouldn't rate them very high but with those champions are pretty incredible yeah, with those champions, I, I was getting Rift Spasms up to, I think, six, six sevens, and I think I got a Rift Spasm up to an eight, nine, um, drawing additional cards. The Arena Regular and the Web Scribe, both really, really powerful troops that um, just trigger off of how you are gaining charges, which is every single time you are playing either an Ardent or an Underworld troop. Web Scribe giving you a little bit of board control. Arena Regular flat out dealing damage to your opponent every time. And there's something to be said about this particular format. If you're able to push through damage outside of combat, just just to whittle away at your opponent. Yeah, definitely. Um, Rift Spasm, I got to pull three of them in there and... It's just crazy when you get so much advantage off of them. You get card draw, you get either plus two, plus two, or a bolt spasm. So all the charge theme generation is pretty fun, and it also um, enables you to play older champions too. Even if you don't have this particular champion and you have a lot of cards that um, basically are charges matter cards Mm -hmm. or uh, give you charges, you can enable those old champions to work like Haraza or uh, Neve, Neyev or whatever, however you pronounce your name, the one that has the uh, card draw banner that comes into play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like um, the crackling, um, I think there's still the crackling tides when we go back to 665. There's Zap in the limited pool. Um, can you think of anything else that lets you generate charges besides those particular cards? Um, crackling Torment? There is also a five drop that has scrounge two gain two charges i believe and then there's a uh, four quick drop that's the ploy um that, that's that kyoto that gains a charge as well yeah and then there's ayatachi um coin mm-hmm. there, there's a few additional ways to know um that we didn't really have in the past yeah, so just really, really strong. If you if you see a rift spasm get passed to you, or or you see um, a rift spasm in your first pack and you don't pick it and you see it wield, it is one of those things where if you have three or four of them, um, it is really strong. But then you gonna kind of have to make sure you either dr- uh, draft 
all ardent or all underworld, which may be difficult if you are running a Ruby Sapphire. I know when I draft my three Rift Spasms, I was trying to draft all ardent, and I would see. I would see a web scribe pass to me like as like a third pick. I'm like, I, I can't take this card, even though it works with my theme. It, 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 it might set me back where the rift spasm just wouldn't synergize enough. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't drafted as much as I'd like because I, I really only have as, uh, more time for Evo mm -hmm. games. But um, what I've noticed is that at least in Evo, it's sometimes you just get the right pull for a charge themed deck and, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's going to be ardent and sometimes it's going to be underworld um and you just kind of have to go with it um but i i could see in draft um if i see a sign for rift spasms that are that's open mm -hmm. i would definitely start going for cards that might be more underrated like zap yeah and i i think this is just one of those situations where when you look at your EVO pool and you look at your sealed pool, you may not necessarily recognize the potential here. So that's why we're going to be going over some of the different types of archetypes that we've noticed. If you guys see additional archetypes that we forgot, please, please let us know. Leave it in the comments below or um, ping Nico and we'll make sure to bring them up. I guess raise the general skill level of all of our listeners so that you guys can consistently get five wins in your evos and in your seals. Moving right along, um, we go on into um, Dreadlings. Dreadlings as an archetype is absolutely, absolutely deadly, especially when you combine it with the underworld troop that gives plus one, plus one to all of your troops until the end of turn, and if you can get a technician. Um, have you had any luck with Dreadlings, and what are your either horror stories or victory stories of, of Dreadlings? So Dreadlings are great now. Um, they're to the point where they're blowing up the constructed scene as well. Maybe we'll look at a slide on that later. Mm -hmm. um, very, very strong, and, and it's not just blood sapphire that dreadlings are strong in you can definitely go wild sapphire mm -hmm. now you can even go wild blood um i've even made wild diamond dreadlings work really not. so yeah there so there's just um some funny synergy with dreadlings if you're playing wild diamond where um you can take advantage of both mobilized triggers and um, sacred stance if you got a few of the um, conscripts mm. to just make them even that much stronger so um yeah it, it's just it's interesting to see the different ways dreadlings are played one of the biggest enablers right now is the, the three drop dread apprentice that you have here on the screen and then tomb swap with a card like um uh, what's what's the one that puts more drillings? Well, Dread Apprentice with Tomb Swap is amazing yeah. by itself. Then yeah. you have the, the two drops that um, have the diligence trigger when they're ready, create mm -hmm. two drillings. Um, yeah, there's, there's just so much drilling generation now that you don't even need to um, worry about like waiting for a banner or something to get the activation going. Yeah. Um, um... Uh, when we took these screenshots, we, we were all drafting 666, or it was all the 666 pools. Dread Factory was not part of the equation yet. Um, the 2-drop 1-4, where it is Diligence, Create 2 Dreadlings, um, amazingly powerful. Um, going off of the Tomb Swap and Dread Apprentice that Nico was talking about, um, in some games, I was purposely trying to kill my Dread Apprentice so that I could Tomb Swap him and scrounge twice so I would have seven dreadlings on a single turn, and and yeah, with four with f one card and four resources, and if you have the web spinner prelay in play, you're going to be swinging with seven two, two or seven three twos on that particular turn, and just dealing massive amounts of damage, just trying to overrun your opponent. Yeah, I'm almost thinking that like scrounge being repeatable <laughs> seems a little too strong. I don't know, like mechanically like if that was the right decision because it, yeah. it seems like it could totally leave to a lot of degenerate decks but maybe that just means that there's going to be more cryptate in the future to mm -hmm. deal with it yeah i, I think a cryptate is get, definitely going to be something as well tomb swap definitely watch out for scrounge a tomb swap with the shadow blade slicer is also very good 
um, being able to put minus three minus three twice or even three times if you can tomb swap multiple times you, that shadow blade slicer essentially becomes what like an ex explosion times three and you get a body and you get some really really crazy and interesting things as well and anything else you want to add on dreadlings uh sure yeah tech tactician the one cost from sapphire is very good also arcane soil which is a five cost um wild sapphire card it says draw two cards and create a dreadling for each card in your hand mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty good one uh, so the, just other ways to, you know, make dreadlings stretch a little bit further. The the technician guy is cool because he also um, pumps up any other artifacts you have in play. Well, and it's it's only they're... it's only other robots, right? It's not necessarily artifacts. Uh, yeah, I think it is robots. I, I don't think I have one in my pool that I'm looking at right now. But yeah, I, I think it's other robots. And then there's also the potent uh, puffball. Mm -hmm. And sparkle, um, what's it called? Sparkle caps from Wild mm -hmm. that are really nice to have too. The potent puffball, if you can combo on turn five, get him into play on turn four, he will make all of your drillings terrifying because he gives them plus two attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just absolutely, absolutely scary. Your opponent definitely has to kill that puffball. Um, it, it's just. It's it's just terrifying, and there's there's nothing we can else we can really really say about that. Um, if you happen somehow in my pool, I also had a Graven Geist, which made this particular Evo run for me absolutely hilarious. Graven Geist gives all of your other troops scrounge two. This gets plus two plus two. So yeah, if you can yeah, find that, that synergy, bonkers. Yeah, that I don't that, have any of them yet, but I I've, I've just been thoroughly curb stomped by them. Yeah. And they say anytime a troop is removed from your crypt, it gets plus one. No, is that, the, is that it? Yeah. If any time yeah. a troop is removed from your crypt, it gets plus one attack. And it's a, it's already a one cost one, one flyer. So built in evasion on top of it. Um, like I will put it down and I, all you can really say is, I hope you don't have a cheap shot. I hope you don't have a cheap shot. I hope you don't have a cheap shot. <laughs> all right. Moving right along. Um, and this was something that uh, that I had recognized or, or realized after looking at all the cards that there's actually a cycle of one cost conscripts, which really, really makes draft and limited much more interesting. You never really saw a lot of a lot of action early on in terms of one cost cards, but cheap shot, boisterous ballad, moon call ceremony, windborn ascension, and ear lackey are all I would say at least uh, pick three picks, or um, or at least um, solid inclusions in any in any Evo or any sealed that you may be running. Yeah, um, it's really hard for me to make a judgment call on which one I like the most. I, it's got to be between Eager Lackey and Moon Call Ceremony. I think. Are uh, like. I'm sure everyone that is looking at these five cards right now, they have a horror story and they have a victory story with each of these <laughs> cards. Um, Boisterous Ballad, my opponent on the play, turn one, Boisterous Ballad, turn two, Llama Herder with speed. Oh, man. Yeah, and, you said he's still able to kill it there, right? Yeah, I, well, he, he was stuck on two resources for the next four turns after that. So, like, but really, he had, he was discarding cards, but he had six, or he had five llamas in play <laughs> because he would attack with the llama and then, like, he would ready and then he would have another llama ready to make him a 3-3 three, three the next turn and then a 4-4 four, four the next turn and a 5-5 five, five the next And I could never get a blocker down in order to stop that that large of a body and it, it was just a problem moon call ceremony um i think i had to deal with a hero of legend on turn two so that yeah, that's my horror games, story there I got that. yeah um i'm sure all of us have those horror stories windborne ascension i think i actually got the, a gem soul feeder so i ended up getting a three drop two two life drain flight and I that got a Fenteo, the brute priest <laughs> Because Fenteo needs flight. Yeah, this makes him a little bit harder to hit. All right, and then behind that, I'm I'm sure Eager Lackey that 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 Eager Bunny with such a big smile, 
and the number of duplicious dukes that come out after him, I do not know. <laughs> and um, high infinite tricks too. Oh yeah, when were you weirded out the first time you saw like a high infinitrix covered in wild? Yeah, it's really funny to see the art on a different background. I, I I like it a lot. It's just it makes the card feel completely different. Yeah, it, it like you you almost have to like you look at the card and you read the card, and you're like, okay, what 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 is this card doing? And you're like, oh, I know what this card is. What's what's crazier is when you when you get a card that has empower. And then it like like the art changes because it it can't really go to the like the actual card that it's supposed to be for some reason. Like the art change, like I I don't know because like it, it yeah, shifts just the color. The car. I've gotten just the card on moon call ceremony, and then the art just gets completely destroyed. I don't know what happens. Yeah, maybe that's an issue that they're they're gonna fix. But I keep on looking at the card, and I like I think I got a a, a totem. Like Moonfire Totem, the one that gets plus one, or it's a one four that gets plus three attack and swift strike if you gain life. And I couldn't recognize the card until I read it a couple of times. And then you realize how much the card imagery actually affects your gameplay and all that. Definitely. Yeah, uh, it, it does uh, change the, the way you, you think and appreciate the cards. All right, and well, what's worth noticing um, and worth revisiting are the outposts. Um, currently, we are still in the celebration weekend, the release uh, weekend. I think it goes until tomorrow night, um, just because there were tomorrow some morning. issues. Oh, tomorrow morning, just because there was some sort of issues with uh, with the release, um, with the start of the release. But when we do start drafting six six five, or when we start having a, pack, a set five hero fall packs in limited again um the outposts i i know that i've been pushing the outposts for as long as i can remember saying outposts are gonna be awesome be on the lookout for them they are awesome with diligence and what have what have your findings been nico um you know i'm starting to think that if these outposts are picked early I'm trying to think what would be the most popular maybe Treacherous Pass. Really? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're trying to counter Dreadlings, or if you're playing Dreadlings and that's what you're afraid of, that could be a pretty good one. I don't know. I don't know. They're all really good. Hilltop Monastery, Dread Factory. I think they can all see a lot more play. Uh, Verdant Mill would be the only one that I'm a little, like, iffy about. Yeah, a Verdant Mill is a little bit of a stretch if you really want to get... If you really want to get that diligence, I'm trying to think of uh, any sort of wild card that has diligence that I'm afraid of. Mm, yes, there's two very strong diligence trigger wild cards. One is the three drop troop that gives it spell shield and plus two plus two. And the other mm. one is the one that uh, starts as a two two for two. And oh, every the crush. Time it, uh, yeah. diligence, it gets plus one plus one. Yeah, so it, it that's the Shin hair that's a two drop two two crush diligence it grows, yeah. and then the and, and it's a permanent growth as a yeah. and then you have the spell shield as well which becomes a bit of an issue, and yeah like dread factory I'm also scared of because of the three drop one three lethal diligence opponent discards a card, and like hand destruction every time you ready that is absolutely scary. The Dreadling Generation off of Treacherous Pass. The Hilltop Monastery also scares me because of the 2-drop 1-3 that conscripts a 1-cost troop. Yeah, the Blood Scout. Yeah, that's true. I mean, any any troop that has the trigger that can get away with not attacking mm -hmm. has a better chance to trigger off of Outposts. But that doesn't mean that there's not plenty of removal in set 6 to deal with them like... Um, chastise kills the one three lethal because the lethal will hit itself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there's, you know, strangle. All, there's all sorts of great removal. Yeah, it it really feels like there's a good balance between remo like your things, your things stick a little bit, but at the same time, your big threats get removed off the board, which I think is a good balance to how things were back at Hero Fall. Uh, the Twilight Revenant, there was only a limited number of things that could really get him or her off the board. 
bouncing, spoils, explosion, and, and you generally almost had to just hold that particular card if you saw your opponent playing a blood diamond or if they happened to splash that other additional resource. You, you, you thought to yourself, I have to sit here and wait and make sure that I don't get attacked with a life drain, invincible rage troop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, I think the outpost will see a lot more play. But um, definitely, if you see an outpost, at least you know you're, you're probably going to survive at least a, an extra turn or two, potentially, because they do kind of slow down the format a bit, which I like. Mm -hmm. All right. And one thing that I was I remember as I was walking and, and just being a fly on the wall at the Hex headquarters, and some of the designers were saying, do, do you guys think, or us as players, do we think every shard combination is actually playable and and they and they started having discussions and i and i wanted i was wondering do do you feel that every shard combination is playable in 666 and 665 mm, i'm trying to think so the, the okay you got a nice slide that supports it here um yeah, so yeah, so we're looking at Arcane Soul. You've already mentioned uh, Sapphire Wild being very good on Dreadlings. You've mentioned uh, Sapphire Blood being good on Dreadlings. And you've mentioned, uh, what was it? What was the Wild what? Sapphire, Diamond, Diamond Wild. Diamond Wild, Wild Blood, good on Dreadlings. We mentioned Rift Spasm having good synergy if you went the charge charge route, but you needed Ardent and Underworld working together. Weeping Banshee, a Blood Diamond. I yeah, think. I guess they're all good. I, yeah. And I've seen uh, Wind Drake and other people talk about Sapphire Diamond doing really well together. Yeah, um, I think Sapphire Diamond was the was the ugly stepchild of 555. You yeah, rarely well, ever I saw it. I think it. I've been like mentally blocking it, but I I have been beat by it quite a few times. Yeah. And the other one that I haven't played a lot of, um, I've played almost all of them, but Sapphire Diamond and Ruby Blood are the two that I've played the least of. Ruby Just Blood, because. really? Uh, are, you, are you talking about 666 or 55? Five? I'm talking about 666 okay. uh, this this uh, weekend and stuff. Are, are the two I have played the least of. Uh, Wild, I mean, sorry, Diamond, Sapphire, and Ruby Blood are the two combos I've played the least of this weekend. And it just is based on the pools I've been getting. I, I just don't think my pools were as strong for those particular color matchups. Yeah. I really want to somehow get Lasgard's Blood Letter into Dreadlings. It, it it seems like it would be so good. Like, sacrifice another troop, deal one damage to target champion. So, you know, after... Yeah, I've I splashed just to play that card a few times. I've even had two of them in my pool. But it, it does take some time to get going. So I, I don't highly prioritize him as a big threat. Yeah. And then I, I I had luck with what Wild Ruby Surging Wildfire is an amazing card. Um, I think I was able to deal over twenty damage on a single swing um, with only with only four resources. But I had two of the mobilizes that give uh, mobilized actions that give plus four attack plus two defense, and I had other troops on the board. And I had the hero or the champion power that says this gets plus three, plus three, and crush. So the surging wildfire was a base of three after the rage, plus the plus three, plus three from the hero power, plus an additional eight off of the two mobilizes. And he 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 block he tried to block it, and he was like down to one. And I sacrificed my surging wildfire, but when you deal that much damage, it, yeah, it was, okay, that yeah. is a time. That I don't know if you saw, but I, I, I should have shared one on stream, but I had a game where I took a screenshot. I had a single locket of reflection, and I had a bunch of two loves in my pool, which is crazy for Evo. Mm -hmm. And one of them happened to be Surging Wildfire, so I was playing oh. Grandfather Elk. And two times out of my five, I think I went five and one, so six games, mm -hmm. um, I got the Surging Wildfire doubled from the locket and um, then just pop the crush on one of them and just swing uh, swing with both. So it was a pretty good feeling to get that double value off the locket in EVO. Yeah, very, very good. So I, I think this is a, a absolutely amazing pool. A sacred Stance, 
um, seems like the, the the forever's bloom of six six of, of anything that is in Scars of War, um, and yeah, I really like how every single combination and when you draft when you play in limited feels like there's a definite archetype and they and they kind of overlap overall together so hats off i don't know if the people at hex entertainment are listening but th thanks for making i gotta say one of the best feeling limited like l limited events out there for quite some time how do you how do you feel about playing limited here d d are you having more fun oh yeah i'm having so much more fun i mean uh, set five kind of I, I don't know what what was wrong with it but it just it was still fun for me to play but it was the least fun out of all the combination of sets that i've played in the past and i think it has a lot to do with how aggressive the format was mm -hmm. and how it really kind of favored um certain color combinations more than others but this one is just a blast i i look forward to playing more of the mixed set Mm -hmm. now but uh just even set six by itself was fun to play yeah it I, I got to agree with you i think i think what it what it is is there's more meaningful decisions that you make in with scars of war in your games like wh where you think to yourself okay do i play the drill card the three cost drill card that will give um, or do I conscript first or, or, or certain things and you, and you make these decisions and you think about things long term as opposed to, okay, I'm going to play, uh, I'm going to play this on turn two, play this on turn three, give it rage, play this on turn four. And if my opponent has a way to stop me, then he wins. If he doesn't, I win. And it almost felt like you were, you were going up against the shuffler more than your opponent sometimes. Yeah, and I think mobilize goes a long way to making that feel good like that because, you, yeah, you do have some troops that might cost a little bit more, but if you choose to, you know, delay your attack maybe mm -hmm. and put this six cost into play for four, you know, you, you could be getting a little bit further ahead. Um, so, yeah, making decisions like that is um, definitely something that we didn't have a uh, great experience for in sets five only because of cards like mama yeti where it's just like i play this i brush face uh stuff like yeah. there's not a lot of decisions in and just beating people down yeah all right so glad glad everyone or the hosts agree that um, scars of war is an absolute blast to draft and play moving along set six only evolution gauntlet madness um call of the Deepwood. When you get a Moon Song Oracle or a Bleak Blade Twister, just a giant troll face on the Moon Song Oracle, because if you are not running Sapphire, you have an entire hand that you can't play any longer. Yeah, I actually beat two people that got that bad luck. They were not playing Sapphire and just completely turned their hand into Oracle Songs. Super funny. The Bleak Blade Twister is not as bad. I mean, Five drops for Underworld are not as negatively impactful, but I think there is a um, there's a pretty good trade off for going Ardent. Ardent has, I would say, some of the stronger troops you could hit from mm -hmm. a Call of the Deepwood, mm -hmm. but then you could get a Moonsong Oracle and totally screw yourself. Um, versus a Bleak Blade Twister is not as bad. Um, it won't totally wreck your hand, but um, there there are some bad ones you can get for Underworld as well. Well, it, it just goes to show you, if you do play Call of the Deep Wood in Limited and you do choose Underworld, make sure it's after your attack. And if your opponent has a damaged troop, you may actually turn Call of the Deep Wood into an amazing play. Yeah, that's true. All right, moving right along. Actually, I thought I had... Did we have one more slide? Oh, no. All right. So moving right along, going into the ladder meta of Ivan Slagpot, we had talked about Dreadlings earlier, and Dreadlings are making a, a crazy, crazy comeback. We have this deck here. Obviously, it is Sapphire Blood, leveraging a lot of Dreadlings. Tribunal Magistrate to be very strong. Dormant ones to just give more attacks attacks to everything. Um, which, oh yeah, Ivan Slagpot as your champion, and Tactician, well... 
it, it seems like this this deck pretty much has everything and there's not a single like chase legendary in this deck list well actually no oh, dormant one dormant one oh i i stand corrected the door has dormant one gone up in value all of a sudden I don't know, but I think it will. This this is one of like the six top decks on Hex Tournaments Icon right now. Um, I think it has like a seventy six percent win rate. Um, I just quickly looked it up. I, I haven't played any constructed myself, but I've there's a lot of people in our um, community and guild that have been playing, and I guess this is one to watch out for. Uh, the Death Seekers are kind of the one of the big pieces of this deck too. Because mm -hmm. they have a double scrounge trigger, one that brings them back into play after they die, and uh, for four scrounge, mm -hmm. and one that gives it rage for one scrounge. So, yeah. um, you, you top that off with all of the dreadling generation through the jargon's workshops and the skittering cultivators and the tacticians, and you got a pretty strong deck, including the four uh, warp steel sh shard swarms that. Um, should not be underestimated. They do take a, a charge from you and give it to them. So they're able to uh, quickly get plus one, plus one, and then they're also preventing your strategy at the same time. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that you just don't really think about. I had a player play two of those back-to-back -back on me in uh, in Evos, and it, it just threw off my strategy in terms of timing, and charge power stealing is... Is actually is very very scary. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, I'm trying to remember which one's the Dread Apprentice. Is that the three two scrounge? Yeah, that's that's a crazy one that you can totally combo with. What I'm surprised to see in this list or not see in this list is that um, they're not making use of the the tomb card. I, I would think that that would be pretty popular um, in this list as well to just get a, a card back quickly and then play again. Mm -hmm. especially if you're playing Dread Apprentice. But I guess it's not... Um, you want to just keep advancing if you're playing a deck like this and you don't want to uh, be messing around with your crypt at all. I, I almost feel that Jorgen's Workshop is actually the weakest card in the link here because, like, is there going to be a situation where you're not going to play a Dread Factory, a Death Seeker, or a Tactician on turn one? And and the Jorgen's Workshop doesn't really give you any value until you have your board already set up. It's almost one of those cards that while you're ahead, it gets you more ahead as opposed to the Tomb Swap where you can grab your Dread, Dread Apprentice and create six Dreadlings or um, grab a Tribunal Magistrate and all of a sudden, like if something was pulled away or even grab your Warp Steel shard sworn trying to get those additional charges that you need to push that additional damage through well maybe it's not as great but jargon's workshop you know even even if you do have it in your opening hand and you play it on one is not horrible it's it really comes down to like you know how many other cheap mixes of underworld troops do you have in your deck to power it up and and this particular deck just looking at the one drops and two drops, you already basically have a mix of all of the different races. Um, you have the Shin Heron, the Dread Botanists, and I think Dread Botanists wouldn't even be played if it wasn't for Jargon's Workshop. Mm. Um, I think that might be why that card's seeing play. And, and maybe Dread Botanist isn't even really necessary in this deck. Maybe you could play a minion of Yakuzan or something else that's pretty resilient. Um, but anyway, um, I think that's why Jorgen's Workshop is seen playing this deck is because by turn three, you can already have it generating uh, four Dreadlings per turn, which well, is already better than a single Dread Factory. Well, turn turn one, you go Jorgen's Workshop. Turn two, you play... A, well, I, guess you could... I think you would turn one, probably go for a Tactician. Okay. Then turn two, probably a Jorgen's uh, Workshop Death Seeker. Three. Okay, okay, I can see yeah, that. I, I I'd have to play with it a bit to see how it really works, but um, I, I think it be, could be good as a early play. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tactician turn one, Death Seeker, Jorgen's Workshop turn two, turn three, Dormant one. That that's that's pretty scary. Yeah. I will I will give it that. All right. All right. I, I I take it back. I should probably play a deck before I. Start to critique it a little bit too much. 
Yeah, I mean, it's really about getting that dormant one to go off too, right? So. Yeah, or, or the multiple dormant ones at, at some point. All right, moving right yeah. along, PVE brainstorming. Um, well, PVE brain, it is, it is definitely you. Take it away. Sure. So just <laughs> three little cards. So one of them happens to be Jorgen's workshop that we're just talking about. Um, I just was quickly looking through some of the cards and equipment. I haven't had a chance to really look at a lot of the equipment yet. Um, after I even made this slide, I looked at some more. I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of cool stuff. But just for some of the cheap one drops, you know, like when you're playing PvE, you do kind of want to look at those earlier game troops. So uh, what kind of lookout has nice synergy with your pets? So you might want to try that out with a pet theme deck. Uh, maybe some Royal Dead Mothers splashed in with Wakuna Lookouts could go quite a long way. Um, Jorgen's Workshop has uh, benefits for playing additional layers. Mm -hmm. So you get more Dreadlings that immediately enter play when a, a lair um, enters play. So that could be really rewarding, um, especially if the lair is super cheap, like another Jorgen's Workshop. And then you have... Um, uh, the Droka Outcast with equipment that gives other Drokas plus one, plus one. So I don't think we have a ton of Drokas right now, but there is that three drop that has a socket that would be affected by this and then additional Droka. So if you have two Drokas in play, um, you're going to give those Drokas an additional conscript, I believe, for each one that's in play. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how that works. I, I'm not sure if it's in addition to oh yeah it's, it's just instead have so um yeah it's nice but i don't i don't know yet how that's going to work with our limited amounts of troka and i haven't seen any other pve only troka yet um, i'll have to look more at the uh, chest loot to see if there, there are more that we can play yeah, so if, if we needed to find faster ways of running and farming gold i'm sure you will do it for us Oh, gosh. Yeah, well, I haven't been at Farming Gold for a while, and that's probably why I don't have a lot of this equipment. I haven't been able to roll my chests. You know, everyone's like, Kismet's packs are 30,000 gold each, and you're like, oh, do I even... I like I've been I'm like do I spin my rare chests anymore, or do I just spin common chests and then try to get yeah. my Kismet reserve packs? What, what, what do I need to do in order to get everything that I need? Uh, it's a headache. Yeah, that's part of the reason why I have no gold. I bought four reserve packs right away with like my stock of gold, and that took all my gold away. And I've only been spinning commons, so we'll see. Eventually, I'll get back to having most of the equipment from the set. All right, so moving right along, we are moving to our new puzzle for the week. It is, um, it is in PvP. It is the It is in Immortal. It's your turn. It's your first main phase. You have one artifact in play, two diamond threshold, two blood threshold, two cards in hand, and eight resources. Your opponent has two war machinists in play, three war hulks, two terabots, two flax scrapper replicas, and they have 20 health. PvP cards only. Champion and charges do not apply. Deck does not, ap deck does not apply, so you have no cards in your draw deck. Uh, this, that means like no interaction with your deck, no interaction with their deck, basically. All right, so you don't, you haven't prophesied, you don't have a free walking calamity coming up as your next card. Set six cards are allowed, extinction not allowed. Win on your turn. What artifact in play? What two cards in hand? Sequencing. What do you got to add? Uh, not much to add. You just verbatim read. The puzzle. So I, I think it should be, I, I want to say it's going to be easier than last week's. It's a set solution. Uh, I don't really want to give away any other hints, but um, I think everyone should be able to figure it out. All right. And before I say anything, um, there there is an artifact that says the first card you play each turn is free. Is that card allowed? That card is allowed. Okay, it is. Yeah. All right. All right, so based off of that, well, anything else that you want to add to us? This show went, I think, a little bit longer, but with a Scars of War release, there's much more to talk about. We can 
um, go over some new decks, more limited play. Let us know what you want us to talk about in the upcoming episode. And other than that, do you got anything else? No, just keep farming your long herders as soon as you can since uh, we're, it's ending tomorrow at 10. Oh, I, I wanted to ask you, how many how many runs did you do and how many llamas did you get? Oh, God, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> no, I, I think I have eight. Um, I need to look. I actually um, I did pretty well, not at the beginning, but I had a streak last night where I just kept going five and X. Mm. Um, so I think I have a, I've, I've done a lot of Evo runs just in my free time on the weekend, like trying to sneak in best of one games mm -hmm. in the middle of parenting. And, uh, eh, I, I think I did fairly well. I, I did have some O and three runs. I did have some one or two win and three losses, uh, runs as well. But, um, the most of my runs have been three or more wins. Yeah, I I think I've I only did six runs, and I have five llamas. That's, I was, I, I was like, wait, I was like, what? I I went three and zero oh in my draft, and then I had I had two gauntlets where I was one and two already, and then my one and two gauntlet got the five wins. I did it again, and then I did another Evo, and I got the five wins. I did a sealed, lost immediately. Did another Evo, got the five wins. I'm like, oh, I, I got my. I got my four, and then I was like, "Wait, did I only have I only not got five wins once?" Wow, wow. that's really good. Yeah, that, I've done one draft, and then I think I've done at least I want to say at least sixteen evos, which is a lot. Yeah, um, and may, maybe seventeen. I don't think I don't think it's any more than that. I was disappointed. Like. I you you had to use hero hero fall packs and a scars of war pack to do the hundred dollar or the hundred plat entry, I think. And I yeah, didn't have any I hero fall packs. The hero fall packs are dwindling, but I still have like the same amount of uh, scars of war packs. I started off with a hundred scars of war pack that I bought. I'm up to a hundred and eighteen right now. I'm like, what? What is this? Oh my god! <laughs> Did you say you're mainly doing draft and sealed? Yeah, I'm, I'm mainly doing draft and sealed, so I. Wow. I got, yeah. How are you going up? Uh, I I I had a draft ticket, so I got six uh, that way, and then I I think I was just climbing the ladder as well, so I got. Oh, okay, the pack rewards. Yeah, yeah the pack rewards and whatnot. Because so. a, a win, a six zero and or a five zero and sealed is the same amount of packs you started with, right? Well, it, it is, but you. But the thing is, you can only apply with four hero fall packs. Oh, that's right. Okay, I see. But you, but you ended up winning six. Man, I should have been doing sealed. Right. Yeah. Sounds no. like sounds like some people knew about that trick. I think I read something about people talking how sealed was the best way to go to farm the set. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm. I guess I'm being cheap. <laughs> The thing that I didn't have the hero fall pack, so I was actually using four scars of war and then paying six hundred plat. <laughs> and, and sealed um, gauntlet is still best of one as well, right? Yeah, sealed gauntlet is still best oh, of one. Man, I should be doing sealed. Ah, okay. Maybe I'm going to change up my strategy for the remainder of the night. Uh, we'll get some sleep. We we've been we've already <laughs> been doing a, a long podcast, long show. Hope you guys enjoyed it. From all of us here at Cornerstone, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And, well, we hope you hear us next week. See you next week.